Welcome to League Legends on Fox Sports, where we continue our journey through the game's wonderful history, accompanied all the way by the great players who made it. Think Canterbury in the 1980s, and it's not overdoing it to use the word dynasty. Their team sheets were populated by a couple of the game's greatest families, and the Bulldogs funded their way to four premierships in the decade. Without doubt, the top dog of that era was Steve Mortimer. Steve, thanks for joining us on League Legends. A pleasure, Tim. Not nice to have a chat with you. One of the fascinating things about your career is its span, you know, from the mid-70s right through into origin. Now, as a 19-year-old, you found yourself on the field with some of the, literally, the, the greatest legends of the game. What was I, that like? I can't tell you all the players. Are play you know, uh, Graham Langlands, Billy Smith, Bob McCarthy, John Sattler. Like, they're the ones I used to watch with mum and dad <laughs> on the black and white TV in Wagga Wagga. So what was it like if you, these guys were tackling you? You were trying to tackle them? Uh, no, it, look, if, if Bobby T Fulton tackled me, I thought, oh, hell, that's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> the coach wouldn't probably think so, but, but no, look, it was just nice to be, be, be a part of their environment. So even abuse, even yeah. a bit of sledging from those yeah. blokes, you felt like you were oh, special. I felt so privileged that Bobby <laughs> Fulton gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Is it fair to say that if you weren't an asthmatic, you wouldn't be called turvy, would you? Uh, that's a very good point. Um, myself and my brothers, we were born in Sydney. Dad was a policeman and I had asthma about five and a half years of age and the doctor said to mum and dad, get him out of Sydney. So dad got transferred to Wagga and started a junior rugby league club called the Kringle Magpies, where they are 53 years old today, still going. And that has been the real making, I believe, not just of myself, but my brothers in growing up and respecting people and no, very wonderful. The Roosters came to Wagga and you snuck into the dressing room and you knocked off Johnny Mays' socks, didn't you? How did you know that? <laughs> Who told you that? Did you research on these I things? Did. I did. I took, I took the socks and I took it back to the police boys club where Dad was. I said, look at this, I, I got these socks. Anyway. Um, and this was all because you'd stood up in school, hadn't you, and, and told these, these people to shut up during the Roosters' visit to your school. Yeah. And they yeah. kicked you out. Well, that's exactly right. Arthur Beecham was there and uh, there were a few girls having a chat or whatever and I'm trying to listen to Arthur and, and I said to the girls, I said, shut up, please, show some respect or whatever. And then I got in trouble with it by one of the teachers and talking to the girls like that. So I didn't swear or whatever, but anyway, it was great to see Arthur Beecham come to our school. Mount Austin High School. It was great, absolutely. And, and the socks, having knocked off Johnny Mays' socks, of course, you're a hero for that, weren't you? Oh, mate, I love the way he played the game too. And uh, look, yeah, I, um, I'm happy to pay for those socks if he... Um, if he ever yeah, comes looking for If he comes them. looking for me, yeah. Mm. But a very, very special memory. You found your way to Sydney. How you do that, we'll talk some more about. But let's have a look at some of your early work for the Bulldogs. <laughs> Mortimer switches the play. Oh, McCarthy through one tackle. Got a pass on the Hage. A beautiful pass out there to Mosley, who comes back inside. It's over Mortimer. And Mortimer's in for the try. Steve, you talked to Bobby McCarthy about that time, and, and he was there for a totally different reason to the, one, the, the reason that you were there. You were a rising star. He was there to, to help out, wasn't he? Well, the wonderful thing about Bob McCarthy is he was a mentor, not just to myself, but to a lot of the... Um, uh, the forwards as well and everyone thought the world of him or whatever so I am very blessed to have played with the great Bob McCarthy and to, for him to have a big effect on my style of play. Like a lot of great players you got dropped early didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Why was that? Um, it was because um, I didn't tackle and um, Malcolm Cliff wanted me to say listen I want you to be a, a cover defender and tackle. And so um, I, I could tackle and I, I'd, I'd line it up and he'd show me and I'd watch a couple of videos. And um, so I, was, uh, I wasn't in the, the front. The Your front. asthma had shaped you as an athlete, hadn't it? And yeah. You had, a, you had a, a way of thinking about what you could do on the football field and, yeah. and what form that would take. Look, absolutely. But also off, off the football field, we had the uh, trainer come on and off and I, he'd um, have my little uh, puffer. And that helped me sometimes as well. But I didn't really, the more I, I, as I got older, the less I needed that with asthma. So 
it was all good. If Bullfrog Moore hadn't been a real person, someone would have invented him. And he went off to Wagga to get his player, namely Steve Mortimer, didn't he? How did he do that? Well, I, I was... Uh, my first game for Riverina. And the only reason I played for Riverina was the halfback was saving himself to play in the country championships. Anyway, um, they had the opportunity to play for uh, Riverina, had a reasonably good game. Against, and then, against Canterbury? Against, against Canterbury, yeah, back then. And then probably two weeks later, Peter Moore came back to Wagga um, to hopefully uh, sign up a country player in myself. And, um, and then Bullfrog said, he said, are you the only one? I said, no, I've got three brothers. He said, oh, OK. <laughs> he, he just, his eyes lit up. He said, oh, there might be some more opportunities there. But look, um, irrespective of that, we had Arthur Summons, my father, and Bullfrog, and Arthur Simons just quickly said, look, uh, Bullfrog, uh, uh, Ian, I just want to have a talk with Steve out there. So I went out there and Arthur Simons said, I reckon you should um, keep yourself here for a couple of years. You'd be worth a little bit, little bit more money. He said, but also, he said, you Mortimers, you're Protestants. He said, and Cath uh, he said Canterbury, they're all Catholics or whatever. And, um, and I said, oh, I don't give a rats or whatever. And the other thing was um, with... Uh, Bullfrog being a Catholic, the Mortimers being Protestants or whatever. He heard me because when I came out, he just had an angry look on his face. And Dad's really embarrassed. He's had a red face. Anyway, and Bullfrog's just come up to me. He said, listen, son. He said, I love your uh, confidence. He said, but us Catholics have got bladder, better bloody contacts up there than you Protestants. <laughs> now, the 1977 Interstate Series was your first taste at that level. Tell us the story of when you went to Brisbane and, and you're rooming with Tom Radonikus. OK. My dad phoned me. He saw my big ugly melon on the front of Rugby League Week, A Star Is Born. And dad being the police, said, Stephen, congratulations. He said, I'll put you on to your mother um, and then I'd like to have a talk to you about this, uh, this Radonikus. He uh, said something else too. And uh, anyway, see him. so mum, oh, Stephen, that is such a beautiful photo of you. <laughs> I really like, well, have a look at my melon, fair dinkum. But, but being mother. She's your mother. But yeah, she said, Stephen, because you're an asthmatic, I'm going to send down some hankies, mm. undies and singlets. And a fruitcake, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, thank you, mum, that, that, that would be great. I got it two days later. The next day we, 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 we get on the, on the plane. So I take my two bags, quite embarrassed because Arthur Beaton's got a little bag and Tommy's got one or whatever. So we get, we finally arrive in Brisbane and then you get on the bus and you go up the top, you got all the guys have played 30 tests for Australia and New South Wales. So uh, Arthur, uh, sorry, um, Arthur Beaton was up there. Tommy was up there. Then there was Mick Cronin a little bit further down. There was Steve Rogers. Uh, there was Johnny Peard back up there as well. And then with a few forwards, and my best friend on the bus was the bus driver. <laughs> I hadn't achieved anything, so I had a chat with him or whatever. So I was, I was out of it or whatever. So and the other blokes didn't want to have a chat or whatever. So we get to the we get to the uh, we get to the hotel, and uh, they hand out um, McCarthy, Hill, um, uh, Reddy, someone else, uh, um, St Steve Rogers. Mick Cronin, Mortimer Donigas. So I've picked my two bags up. I've looked around. Tommy's not there. He's probably uh, probably wasn't too happy or whatever. So I, I walk in and I see this big king size bed. And I'm going, that's that's way bigger than Mum and Dad's bed back in Wagga. And there was a single bed. So I put my stuff on the on the king size bed. And I uh, got the, the uh, Rugby League week out in the jersey or whatever. And I get this knock on the door. And I was about to just get up and then who comes through? That's my roommate. It's the first time I've seen him since I got on the plane. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Tommy, Tommy uh, he gets up, he walks past and he sees the, he sees the, uh, the king size bed. He goes, he says, what are you doing on that bed? He said, that's mine. I said, no, Tommy, it's mine. 
And I showed him the seven jerseys. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. <laughs> anyway, anyway, the <laughs> other, he said, no, no, that's mine. I said, Tommy, my dad I, told me you'd try to upset me or whatever. I, I said too much to him. Mm. I said, but um, uh, I, why don't we smoke the peace pipe and uh, you, we make us a cup of tea? <laughs> Tommy's just gone, make you a cup, cup of tea? Of you little nuff nuff, you little nothing. You want me, to, son, you, you don't get this right. I'm going to have the cuppa. And he said, and if you don't get off that bed, then maybe, and I'm, I'm going to say this, maybe one of those pillows I might think could be a toilet. <laughs> I'm not going to go anymore. And I, and I got up and I, and I said, Tommy, how do you take your cuppa? <laughs> and he's, he's, he's tough. It was just a, hot, a cold black coffee, no milk, no sugar. Anyway, uh, Tommy eventually got the king size bed, and I, I had the single bed. So I can't say much more than that. But it, it's apocryphal then that he threw your bag out the window. That's just a bit of an embellishment, is it? Oh, well, I forgot that. Yeah, because when he came over, I, I, sh I shut my eyes. I thought, geez, he's going to hit me or whatever. <laughs> anyway, he just picked it up, and I, I heard the the window uh, open up, and I, I like that, and he threw him out the window. And he I did. said, Tommy, I said, I, uh, again, I said, Dad said you'd try to upset me or whatever. I'll pick that up, mate. I'll get that later. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. I... Uh, and the match itself, though, was a bit of a turning point, wasn't it, in your career? Because you'd had such a uh, terrific game, City Country. You'd, you'd got that number seven jumper. Yeah. And even though New South Wales won that match, it sort of just didn't go the way you wanted, did it? No, it didn't. And I got replaced by um, uh, ter uh, Terry Fernley who captained us in the 85, uh, one, which we'll talk about that later. But, no, I, I came off. Tommy came on. Um, I think he might have um, uh, biffed... Uh, he did. <laughs> the, mm. He started the, blue. Yeah, yeah. the, yeah, the, uh, the halfback. Um, Oliphant? Eh? Oliphant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greg Oliphant. Mm. Anyway, uh, and then um, we got the penalty. Um, we got a penalty and... We kicked a goal, I think Mick Cronin. And one. Yeah. Mick Cronin won, yeah. So, and then uh, they named the Australian side, I think, that evening, and I certainly wasn't named. So I thought, oh, well, I'll get, hopefully I'll get another chance. Sportsbet's new Super Fantasy Soccer app, you can win a share in 500 grand. So we only had enough left for Jimmy Trahill to promote it. It's really good. Download the app now and play for free from Sportsbet. Gamble responsibly. What I enjoy about retirement living is it's a much easier life than what my husband and I had before. We feel secure. We just enjoy ourselves. What will you look forward to? Take the first step to great retirement living with Aveo. Doesn't matter where you are, you're never far from the middle of my heart. You should know that wherever I go, take a moment to let love show. There's nothing like cricket. It's sunshine, snags, samosas, slip slop slap. Bring your mates, your mob, your yaya, your nonna, your nani. Sink on the lips, hands on the hips. Heroes. How's that? Hot days. Oh, where's the shade? The worrying. The winning. The wishing you were here. It's old friends, new friends, staying till the end. It's cricket and there's nothing like it. You're in the representative wilderness uh, for the end of the 1970s, but by the end of that decade, Bullfrog Moore had three Mortimers, uh, three Hughes's, and sundry other talent at the Bulldogs. Now, 
The Mortimer family videos of the time are a little bit different to the rest of us, Steve. Let's have a look at one. Mortimer, Hughes, cuts out Farrah, finds Peter Mortimer uh, out wide. Actually, Chris came into the play and got a magic pass away. Peter Mortimer's gone downfield. Andrew Farrah takes it up inside the 32. There goes Steve Mortimer. He's away. Scores. Steve Mortimer. Well, that had Mortimer written right across it. The three brothers all involved. What a super try. Let's talk firstly about the emotional side of being on the field with your siblings week after week at the highest level. What was that like? Uh, very good. I always felt comfortable when my brothers were there. And just also, um, I've got to say, Andrew Farrah, he's a country boy from Cowra. And he threw me that last pass, and he was a, 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 a great person too to, to, to play with as well. So, it all were, but it was special to play with your brothers. It really was. You once said that rugby league's best when 12 other players know what the 13th is doing. You <laughs> sort of had that, didn't you, in threes? Yeah. Because half the team are siblings. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, like, we used to play cr football in the, ba in the backyard of Wagga. <laughs> but I'd pick Chris because he was the, he was the big tough one. And Peter and Glenn would work against us. So, look, it was great. It was, it was great to play with them all. And, and uh, yeah, very special moment uh, for, for my, my mum and dad. 1979 was a bit of a dress rehearsal, wasn't it? You played St George in the grand final. Um, and then 1980 was the big show. That was when Canterbury more or less came of age, didn't mm. they? Look, the 79 um, and um, at half time, we were down something like uh, 15 points to three. Ted Glossop was our coach. And he said, boys, this is our, my first grand final. And Ted Glossop said, what are you doing? He said, get out there and play like you normally play. He said, that first half was nothing. He said, get out there and enjoy yourself. And I was a, a bit um, like a, a, a rabbit in, a, in spotlight or whatever. Anyway, we started scoring tries and put us in a good frame of mind should we get to a grand final in the following year. And you were a different team really, weren't you, in terms of attitude when you did make the grand final yeah. the next year? I, I've got to say that having played a grand final is an absolute asset for, for a player should you play another grand final. I found that, I'm sure the Hughes boys did and I'm sure that my brothers did as well. And um, it was just, uh, it was just uh, um, a better outcome and a wonderful grand final in 1980. Yeah. yeah, it was just, it was wonderful. And, um, and we just kicked on that night, had a nice time. And, it, you know, we all felt we were very blessed. Turvey, who should wear the number seven for Australia is sort of like the water cooler topic in rugby league. You had the job here in 1982, but then came the Kangaroo Tour. It's very fickle, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, look, um, uh, Wally Lewis and I made our de debut in 1981 at the SCG. And, um, and then 82, um, I think Parramatta won and, um, and Sterlo beat me for, the, for that. And, and you know what? I wasn't a sook or like that. I just wanted to play my best I can and you know as things happen but I know that um, back in those days um, I've got no doubt that Peter Sterling um, absolutely deserved what he received but he also um, had or Parramatta had a very influential coach in the fellow called the great Jack, Jack Gibson. After five seasons of losing State of Origin and not that you'd played in every game, what did you see at the end of 84, when they made you captain, that you could do to change that? Very interesting. In the last game in 1984, a lot of the, the New South Wales boys pulled out of it to play for their club. My brother Chris got an opportunity. And the wonderful thing was that we had a lot of new young guys. Stevie Morris came to, uh, we were pretty much the same age, but the great thing was, and I'll never forget this, we travelled to Lang Park or Suncorp Stadium as it is today 
And I'll never forget when we, um, all the restaurants were up on top of the hill. And I said to the, I said to the driver, I said, please stop the bus, sir. Anyway, uh, we stopped the bus and I spoke to all the boys and said, have a look at this. They all look at us. They think we're going to get rolled. They all come up and, and do sort of signs. He said, we can make an impact on this, on these people when we come back up again. And uh, anyway, um, uh, we, we all got together. And uh, I just think over the years, I really had a chance to communicate with all the players. Everyone's different, but everyone brings a great skill to the team game of rugby league. And that's exactly what I saw in 84. And then I was very blessed to have been named as the captain in 1985. We had a, probably a, a little bit more of a different team. We had a lot of those blokes that didn't play that last game come back to play. And um, look, uh, I'm just, I just feel very privileged to have been the first captain to have won a, a State of Origin series against uh, the great team Queensland. Well, it was a lot of planning and a lot of work. Let's take a look at the eventual fruits of all that work. Moments away from an historic State of Origin series win. Here's Kenny. Pure heaven. And how sweet it is. Steve Bottomer's face tells it all. New South Wales 21, Queensland 14. The Blues wrap up the State of Origin series for the first time. The ecstasy of it all. Steve Bottomer being held aloft by his New South Wales charges. You don't see many Origin captains get chaired off and the kind of joy that you were showing there really, it said it all, didn't it? Because it had been a while. Yeah, I'm getting spines down my back. Now, we were very close. Mm. Our team was very close and Terry Fernley was our coach and a wonderful bloke and he, let, he allowed me to have a buy-in to talk with the players too. The most important thing is that we are one of. We aren't the one. We are one of, in, in other words, the 15. It, was, it, it wasn't 17 back in those days, two reserves. And uh, it was just, everyone was focused. Everyone was there to help each other, to care for each other. And without saying, being corny, to love each other. And it, you know what? I'm just so glad that we played well and we created history for New South Wales. This passage of your career is so fascinating because it was when Warren Ryan had come to Canterbury in 1984 and your relationship with him, very complex, very productive for the club, mm. but you once described it as being a bit like the Berlin Wall. Mm. How did you reconcile his style of play, uh, his, his attitude to the players and with what you wanted to do and with what he had in mind for you? I could see where Warren was going in the style of play that the Bulldogs are going to play. We had a hell of a lot, lot of good big forwards. And all I had to do is, is, is go behind them, offload the ball and keep the ball going. So look, over that time, um, Warren and I, we sat down and we, you know, we had a good, a, a good talk. And um, as I said before, the coach is the number one person and then it's the players. And I just wanted to get his feedback or whatever. And maybe a couple of times we, we didn't agree, but I always am a believer that the coach is the man that is going to uh, uh, affect us in how, how we play the game of rugby league. And I could see with our, our, our forwards, we would be mad if we didn't use them. We had a great forward back, but we also had a good, great um, backpack, uh, sorry, backs as well. Talking about those grand finals, Bullfrog Moore had this... I'm surprised you, you, you knew that or whatever. It went from 76 or 79 when we were our first up through till um, 88. And, um, but at the SCG, um, look, he'd have a chat with me and he was very family oriented and thinking about how we play and what 
ever he said to me, he said, please keep that to yourself, Turvey. So that's between Bullfrog and me, Tim. I'm sorry. I'd love to, love to tell you, but uh, it's, it's between the great Peter Moore, who was an absolute um, wonderful person to bring harmony of a team together. They were always great scenes, weren't they, at the end of those grand finals because, again, the team being made up of the two sets of siblings and the rest of you very tight, it was always fabulous uh, when that moment happened at full time and, you know, you'd sort of see the team gather and then you'd see all of you guys get together and here's the closing moments against St George. Warren gets up, it's time to go down and see the players. You and Paul Langmack, what do you recall of this? Well, I thought we played quite well. And what Warren Ryan said he wanted us to do, that's exactly what I did. He asked me to kick the ball up high into, to the fullback. Now, some of these oh. kids have kids now, don't they? Yeah. My, uh, the one in my left hand, um, Andrew, he's got two young boys now, uh, um, Lachlan, who's playing his first year of football, Tim, <laughs> this year, and young Harrison. So Lachlan is four and a half and Harrison's two and a half, not far off being three. Yeah. Isn't that, that makes that a pretty marvellous shot, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and Chris has got something like, I think, four or five uh, grandkids and I think Peter's got, uh, Peter and Julie, I think they've got two. Not quite as vigorous as rugby league, but shuffleboard has been something that you've been involved in for many years, hasn't it? I'm, yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned it. Um, shuffleboard uh, is an indoor team sporting recreation for senior Australians. Everyone can play it but it's a great team sport. It is like bowls, it's a lot quicker. And um, I, I'm, I'm 60 years of age now. I'm gonna give it at least uh, another couple of years. My, uh, my son will help me a little bit too. So uh, hopefully one day, put it this way, this time next year, if you heard about it, I'm going all right. But if you didn't, at least I had a go. Yeah. Well, Steve, uh, you were part of the team they called the entertainers and uh, that's the way you've been today. Thanks for sharing your history and your stories with us on League Legends. Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. This has been a Fox League production, part of the Fox Sports Network.